spoke a long time ago. I think when I started doing this, and you were, I forget the name of the show, it was Sean Walker. Yeah. And another chap who I didn't speak to at that time. And Butch Wachowski. Yeah, that was yeah. on the Stranger Things show. Yes, that's right. And I just remember coming away feeling like, wow, this guy knows some stuff. <laughs> he knows some stuff. And uh, right afterwards, you sent me that great list of Manta sightings. Yeah. Uh, and just explain to us, just, just for people out there who might not have heard of that before, as I hadn't at the time, you know, what are these, what are these Manta sightings? You know, what types of creatures do they appear to be and, and, and how do they present? Well, they actually are shaped somewhat like a manta ray, an actual sea-bound manta ray. And, uh, but they're flying. And uh, we really don't know what they are. We don't know if they're a, a craft or a biocraft or an actual cryptid itself. Uh, they come in different sizes. I mean, we've, we've had people see them as small as a couple of feet in, in width, uh, as large as maybe 10 foot. So um, there, there are different characteristics, but the one constant is that it seems to fly near water and that it undulates just like an actual manta ray. Huh. Yeah, it's no flat, no real major flapping. It seems to have some kind of uh, propulsion other than the actual wings themselves. But, it, you know, of course, it's flying in the air. Uh -huh. And these, th I've been following these sightings now for almost, uh, for over a decade, I guess. Wow. Uh, the first sighting I got was in West Virginia. Not too, not, not actually too far from where the uh, the Point Pleasant or the Mothman sightings mm. were. And uh, since that time, I've had sightings uh, in Virginia, West Virginia, New York, Long Island, a couple down in Texas, and I did have one out in, in California. So they, I think all in all, I probably had about 15 sightings, uh, some in the Midwest as well, so... Yeah, I, you know, it, it's it's a strange phenomena. I mean, I put it in my last book, uh, and uh, I, you know, I don't really know what they are, but overall the characteristics seem to be pretty similar. When people see them, because obviously they're, I'm guessing they're reasonably high up, in, in the same, when people see them, do they see more silhouettes, or do they see colors, or descriptive features, or are we talking about it as the the observer? Down the ground, you're seeing a, a black silhouette of some kind of animal, manta shaped animal flying in the sky. Or what details do people give? Well, usually they're described as having uh, a skin just like an actual manta ray. There's the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the uh, soft skin, but it's usually gray. Now, I have had a couple people tell me that have seen them at night that they can see the outline, but it's translucent. They can actually see the stars wow. through it. But wow. they, you know, they know the shape is above them. Um, I don't know if that's something that happens at night that it's able to become translucent like that. But uh, I have had a few of those. But during the day, it, it's mostly a, uh, a grayish type of creature that's shaped like, an actual manta ray and it has the ability to fly and in some instances pretty quickly wow yeah this to me i think this is what i love especially with the the phantoms and monsters uh book series that you have and the website you know which probably most people know you for actually the, the phantoms and monsters site i just love the variance of really unusual sightings Oh, I say cryptid sightings. We don't know that they're cryptids, as you pointed out. But there seems to be so much, so much to it, that site. And um, I was talking with Tobias Wayland uh, just a little while back, and he was speaking about how much he, he gained from you in, in his research on the Lake Michigan Mothman. Uh -huh. um, now, that's, you know, that's obviously a, a cryptid that's become very popular from a you know, pop culture uh, standpoint in the last few years in the US. Well, what's your take on that? I mean, 
this is something that's not, as you say, Point Pleasant, etc. There's a history of this creature in the US, but is it just around these areas or is it nationwide, the spread of these, these Mothman-like sightings? Well, the wing humanoids are something that are seen a lot around the United States and in some parts of Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sightings in and around Chicago, around Lake Michigan, uh, they really, they really are not like what people described as the Mothman at Point Pleasant. The wing structure overall is different. It's like a bat-like wing, gargoyle-like wing. Uh-huh. It does have some do have the red eyes. Uh, it has a thinner body style. It, it seems to be less menacing, less threatening than what the uh, the uh, Point Pleasant Mothman was like. So, uh, I mean, I think it's an entirely different being of some type. Is it indigenous? I don't believe so. I think it is possibly interdimensional or has the ability to come but go between alternate realities or different parallel universes or such. Uh, and I have had witnesses tell me that they've actually seen the thing just disappear. Okay. I mean, well, it's flying, like going through an invisible doorway. And, you know, there, there are other factors that have been involved with some of these sightings. I, there's possibility that it may be extraterrestrial related. Uh, we did have one sighting where uh, some type of gray alien being was seen with it. Uh, another sighting where one of these may possibly have been ascended into a UFO. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, we get we get a lot of variations, but um, overall, it, it, it's fairly well described as being a bat wing, five to six foot. Very dark in color, some with red eyes, and uh, with the emaciated light body, small head, that's able to propel itself without using the wings. I mean, it does occasionally use the wings to propel itself, but it's mostly, it mostly jettisons itself without the use of the wings. From the ground up? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's, that's quite amazing as well. And is it seen, when it's flying, is it seen to be gliding? in some way uh, with very low wing flaps or, or do people also see the wings moving at points? Well, we have it. We've had sightings in both instances, but for the most part, it's seen gliding and uh, moving pretty fast without even using the wings. So there's some, there's some aspect, supernatural aspect to it that allows it to do that. I think that's amazing. Now, the question I, I ask people a lot and People who listen will probably be, you know, and I feel this is a little repetitive, but I think it's it's um it's relevant here as well. Is that do you think perhaps that we could be seeing a naturalistic creature that has an ability that we don't yet understand, similar to the ancients who saw um, chameleons or um, um, cuttlefish or you know, the octopus um, changing color and shape and and uh, using their natural abilities to, to camouflage and hide. When you mentioned the mantas uh, suddenly being translucent and re- being see-through almost to, to the observer on the ground, I wondered, you know, would a camouflage, a chameleon-like camouflage of, of an, a creature that was skybound, would it not simply reflect what, what I could see around it, and, you know, aka the stars? And could that, in your view, be a naturalistic ability we just don't understand. No, I th- I just think it's an ability we don't understand as of yet. Yeah. And, and in fact, with most cryptids, I think most of them do have the abilities to either shape shift, somehow uh, cloak themselves to a degree, or are able to move in and out of realities. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, this is, uh, I know that you're not one side or the other, but in, in cryptozoology, this forms a sort of divide, doesn't it, um, where the paranormal crosses over into into cryptozoology. And we have something from a Bigfoot point of view, I guess we would call it the woo, wouldn't we? That's a, a nickname for it. Um, I don't know where that comes from, personally. I never found out where people have more of a, a view of these animals as either being interdimensional or paranormal, or in, in some cases, a, alien, you know, non, um, non-Earth entities. And well, others you think, well, we must just be looking at animals we don't quite understand. And there's, there's that little divide between the communities sometimes. How do you 
balance that. I know you've got a lot of friends on, or in every facet, every corner of this community. How do you balance the, those opinions with the, someone who might be a bit more, well, everything is flesh and blood or it's of the other completely? Well, I, I know in our group, our Fams and Monsters for Research, we have people that believe it's an actual flesh and blood indigenous being that is on this earth plane all the time. Yeah. And according to others, you know, there are others that believe that it's got some uh, supernatural aspects to it where it's able to either change or go into other worlds or actually able to affect the mind of uh, an, a witness or such. And uh, I'm kind of in that camp. And I think I think more and more people that are enthusiasts that are into the uh, Bigfoot encrypted genre are, are starting to open their minds a little bit more. I'm bas- basically for the, in the fact that we haven't gotten any real tangible evidence as yeah. to what these things are. And, uh, you know, we haven't had a body or so, so do we think. Uh, and, uh, you know, the evidence has been very scant. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all speculation to this point. But uh, I, I think as, uh, and I personally believe since the quantum computing is starting to be- become more mainstream and will it will eventually become more mainstream and available to consumers, I, I think that these other realities may become more apparent as time goes on. And if that does happen, uh, we may start getting answers to what we've been people have been witnessing now you know i had i had an encounter with a bigfoot back in 81 and it looked flesh and blood to me uh you know it didn't disappear or anything to that effect so i mean i i think they do have the ability to be i mean as an actual uh corporal being when they do manifest or are on this plane but i think they also have the ability to move between realities by some type of mechanism and you know that we just don't know and i think it's the same to do what's been going on in in chicago with these winged humanoids yeah i think it's the same i think it's the same um the same mechanism that they use and as well as other cryptos like upright canines and such i think they do have the same type of abilities well i mean that that i mean that the upright uh canines for instance that's one that definitely is a a puzzler to me even more than a mothman or anything else because oh, for many flesh and blood types uh believers if you like uh like me if you can't find any justification in the fossil record which as i know is is not complete but still you'd expect maybe something around <laughs> to justify it and yet you know we're left with witnesses who are very credible and um uh a lack of faith to to, to follow up those leads and i, I always say you know one man's me is another man's poison and even in scientific research you need a certain amount of faith to be able to invest yourself in the in the hunt for evidence right so um well look i i think it's you know it's a fantastic subject and whatever they are it's completely plausible for people to start thinking because of the lack of body or the lack of evidence after such a long time now in things like nessie research and, and bigfoot research that there's something else going on. I think that's plausible. Let, let's talk about your Bigfoot sighting, actually. I, I didn't know about that. I'd be, I'd be really uh, eager to hear about that. Yeah, I've actually had two interesting cryptid sightings, one in 81 and one in 88. I had a winged humanoid sighting encounter in, in 88. But in 81, I was um, I was fly fishing on the uh, Pata- South Branch Patapsco River near Sykesville, Maryland. Uh-huh. And this was in May. This was an area where I have fished many, many times before that. And uh, as I was standing in the river, uh, the the bank across from me, I, I noticed a dog, a fairly large stray dog, just moving in and out of the weeds. And, um, you know, I didn't pay him any mind. I knew he was there, so I just went back to fishing. And this this, this river at that point is maybe about, 20 yards in width it's not really wide but uh you know i wasn't far from the dog itself maybe about 30 yards so as i continued fishing i heard a yelp i heard a dog let out a yelp i looked over 
and I saw something large stand up into the weeds. And when I looked at it, I could see it from about mid chest up because the weeds were so high. I couldn't really tell what it was, though it did look, you know, like a hominid of some type. So as I watched this thing moved off to my left, walked out of the weeds, and f- just turned in- and directly faced me. And uh, as we looked at each other for a matter of maybe five to ten seconds, if that much, uh, this thing was about seven foot tall, maybe a little larger, quite massive, wide shoulders, a head that kind of sat on the shoulders, conical skull, uh, dark brown in color, lots of hair. And uh, the face itself was mostly hairless, had kind of darker skin, but the features were very similar to a human and what I could, what I called like a Neanderthal. Uh It had the, uh, the deep brow ridge. Like I said, the, uh, it, it just looked more human. Now it did have the flattened nose, but, uh, you know, it, if I had to, if I had to say right then what it was, I would have thought it was like, I would say a caveman type, you know, or a, uh, early man. So yeah. we looked at each other. It was making a ticking sound, which I noticed, which I later figured was it gnashing its teeth, uh-huh. but it was quite loud. I heard it. I did get a, a, a brief whiff of what smelled like fox urine. Uh, I knew fox urine smell. I used to use it when I used to go hunting. I used to put it on my shoes to uh, mask uh, my odor from when I went deer hunting. Sure. But anyway, it stood there, and we looked at each other. I was probably about 30 yards from it. Did you look it in the eye? Yeah, we were looking right at it. Uh, definitely a male. I could see the genitalia on it. It was uh, massive. And, and were you armed at the time as well? Uh, no, time? I just all I had was my fishing rod. Okay. And Not- I, you know, I'm standing in the river. I couldn't move. I had waders on, and this thing just turned and started walking briskly up into the woods. Mm. So after I picked my jaw out of the water, I <laughs> I got into my <laughs> car. I got up to my car. Uh, I did see the dog. The dog was okay. He had gotten across the river up on the on the road, so he was all right. So I got in the car and I drove back to Sykesville, which is only like three or four minute drive. Uh-huh. Uh, I stopped at a bar, which was located right there on the river or the riverfront. Got on a uh, payphone, called the local police, the Sykesville police, told them what I saw. And, uh, you know, at that time I knew I had heard of Bigfoot, but I wasn't into investigating Bigfoot. But what I did, I was mostly just paranormal investigations uh-huh. as far as hauntings and such spirits. And, uh, I, you know, I had really no real idea what it was, but I, I thought it was a Bigfoot. That's what I thought it was. So I told the police that they said, go back. We'll have somebody meet you there. Well, I got in the car immediately and went right back. Three to four minutes later, got to the spot. When I got there, there was a Maryland State police officer already there with a barrier across the road. Wow. And when I pulled up, I told him I made a report of seeing something. And that uh, to the Sykesville police, they told me to come here. He said, all he said was, you got to turn around and leave. And I said, well, I made the report. He said, no, you got to leave. So I I had to turn around and leave. They so you. I went back, yeah, I went back home and, um, I was home about an hour or so and, uh, decided to go on back. So I, you know, I changed my clothes and everything and went back. And when I got there, I mean, it was cars all up and down the road. It was, you know, I actually had to park maybe a, a quarter mile away and walk back up to where the barrier was. And by that time there was a Howard County police officer standing there. And I walked up to him and asked him what was going on. He kind of chuckled a bit and said, Well, somebody said they saw Bigfoot. Well, I didn't tell him I was the one that said it or the one that reported it. So, and as I was watching, I mean, there were people everywhere. And in fact, there were six or seven people with dogs going in and out of the weeds and such dog handlers. Uh, There was a large white tent set up across the river Hmm. where I had seen this thing. Uh, There were federal 
cars there, what they used back then, they didn't have SUVs. They had those Wagoneers, and uh -huh. uh, there were two of them there, and all kinds of jurisdictional police cars. I, I'd say there were 70, 80 people there, I mean, literally. It was just This is an amazing people. turnout. This was yeah, seriously and, uh, and obviously previously known about. Well, and I also heard helicopters, but I didn't see any. So mm -hmm. what happened was, you know, I, so I left, and I went back and went home, and I actually called the uh, – the television stations in Baltimore and told them about it. They seemed interested and said, well, we'll get back to you. And, uh, you know, we'll interview. I said, fine. So four days later, they hadn't called me. So I called the one station back up, and they literally did not want to talk to me. They hmm. didn't want anything to do with it. So what I found out later was that a woman – in Marysville, which is about three or four miles downstream from where I was, had reported a Bigfoot. Huh. And uh, but I don't think that's what caused all the response. I think what caused it was that this thing. Now, first of all, this area is in the Baltimore Washington corridor, and it's an area. If you live there, you know that there are a lot of government facilities that they're there, but you have no idea what they are. Okay. Now, something must, I, I believe myself that this, this thing was either escaped from somewhere or for whatever reason, but they had, they had quite a bit of interest with it walking around. And, of course, with the government and the federal government getting involved, there was definitely something of interest. Now, this was back in 81. So, you know, this was, uh, you know, I. If, if this happened nowadays, I don't know what the response would be, but uh, they they really seemed intent on finding out or f want, you know wanting to get with this thing you know get this thing. So you know I did I did get back later with with a couple with one of the police officers that was there, and he verified everything in writing to me, and uh, so I know it happened and everything, and uh, you know. It's uh, it's been documented, but unfortunately, none of the, the jurisdiction police have any record of it. I mean, that doesn't surprise you, though, surely. I mean, if if it was, it seems to me from the description you've given me that it's either it was something they lost or something they wanted to find. And, well, um, yeah, I mean, it was either, either one. Reason it's, yeah, either one. They had it, they lost it, or they wanted to capture it. <laughs> Um, for some reason, it's amazing to me. You hear about things like this all the time, and witnesses such as yourself, well, you know, they just left out there by themselves to fight their corner, essentially, aren't they? I mean, did that encounter and the lack of um, follow up or the lack of acknowledgement of it by the TV stations and the, the police in general at that time, did that spur you on to, to take other encounters from people to perhaps help them? get their stories out there as well did it well did that it got me you? yeah that got me interested in it and uh, in fact when this did happen i had found out that there had been some incidents about eight years before that with uh, something they called the sykesville monster and what this was was a bigfoot like creature in the, the same area that had actually got into chicken coops and got into somebody's kitchen and garage at one time and uh many of the witnesses were still around so i actually got to interview many of the the witnesses and in fact i found a couple others that were not interviewed by the uh, press at the time so that kind of got me interested in in the cryptids in general wow and uh that's why i uh started doing what i did you know of course at that time what i was doing was just taking the information i wasn't distributing anywhere it was just you know just a private thing and i did that for a long time before i started writing about it and when did the i mean the sykesville monster i've, I've heard about i've even seen the an artist sketch of it online i think which you've yeah i had a uh, as well. yeah i had a uh, uh retired forensic artist do that from down in Florida actually do that for me from all the descriptions I with my description knew. and descriptions of the uh, the witnesses. Yeah. So that's something you commissioned. I never knew that. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah. wow! Okay, well that's amazing. That this is yeah. That when here's a piece of history. And I, I've looked at that um, picture time and time and time again, and and try to you know, reconcile that to lots of the sightings you get all over the place. Um, and it just seems to to really really tie in. Uh, when you spoke to those witnesses after the one the the previous witnesses of Sykes or Monster, did you find that the creature they described to you? Was it was the dead ringer for the one you'd seen, or did you think it was another creature of the same, but you'd seen a different one? Yeah, I don't know. The, I mean, it the overall descriptions were pretty close. Uh, you know, uh, many of the witnesses never got a an actual sighting of it because of they knew of the damage it did. Uh-huh. Uh But the one that was in the kitchen was seen. And the other that was in the garage asked, <coughs> was actually seen by a police officer wow. and bust the door down while the police officer was there. And uh, his description, now I didn't talk to him, but I talked to somebody in his family uh, that told me what he had seen. And uh, But some of the other ones, some, the other witnesses had seen it from a distance, but... Overall, I think the sightings were pretty close. I think it may very well have been the same creature. It's amazing. It's very, and also, I've, I've never had, Lon, I've never had, and we talked about this before, I've never had a sighting. My, um, and in one way, I used to be happy that I hadn't because essentially um, I, I felt like my mind was still open to what could be out there because it wasn't based upon an experience I had. Of course, seeing is believing. And once you see or what, what is seen, you can't be unseen, essentially. And you probably discover this and uh, experience this with witnesses a lot of the time that regardless of the position they hold in society or what damage it may do to them, once they've seen something like this, they can't go back on it, no matter what it costs them. They have to keep talking, right? Many of them. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, many of them embellish too, but... Uh... Yes. You know, it's 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 good to get the initial report on most of these sightings, and and go from there. Um, unfortunately, people do tend to embellish on the sighting, but uh, as what time goes on, it? what? Why do you think that is? Where do you? Think oh, that I don't comes know. From? With actual I, I, witnesses, you're talking it, about. It does, I mean, it just does happen. I, I guess people in an attempt to maybe get people to believe them. Mm-hmm. They may actually add more to the story. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it depends what kind of response they get. Uh, but that has happened. Now, the one thing about these these sightings around Chicago and Lake Michigan, and I'm pretty sure that Tobias told you this, that we did not get uh, reports that were embellished upon. And in fact, when we did talk to the witnesses, they told us what they saw, and they did not go beyond that. Great. Even after we prodded them a bit to see, you know, try to get it, you know, get them maybe to see if they were lying to us. Mm-hmm. But it didn't happen. It just did not happen. It left such an imprint on them that they told us exactly what they saw and kept doing. I, I, that I like very much. I, do you also look out for... Um, what? trauma-like signs within the witness statement, you know, small, irrelevant details that appear in the story every time they can't forget because it's part of what makes up the sighting. Oh, sure, uh, that's part of the report. Yeah. You know, that's actually part of the report. And, yeah, in fact, you know, we rely a lot on that as far as deeming it as a credible sighting. Mm, same, same. I'm looking for something that I don't need to know about in the report that keeps coming up every time the person tells me. Sure. Uh, you know, some street light that was out that didn't used to be out that they noticed just before they saw the creature, and then it comes up again and again and again. And of course, when people know this, they can they can utilize that effect to hoax you. But not many people go out there to intentionally hoax. There was the odd individual I found with me that occasionally wants to spin a yarn, and it's either because for whatever personal reasons or problems that they have going on, they they need that made up experience in the drama of telling somebody or or that they genuinely are in an unfortunate 
uh, mental health position where they believe they've seen something that hasn't happened, but it's, it's so unusual. It rarely happens that way. Uh, how do you weed out the good from the bad with the reports? Uh, is it just these small details, or is it in the retelling? And how do what, what keys do you use, or, or are they talk? Well, to you? I, you know, I, I, you know, that's one one aspect of it. Trying to get them to embellish, uh, you know, by maybe making a suggestion to see how mm. they react to it. Mm -hmm. uh say well you know did it have this did it have that yeah and if they agree with it you know then you kind of start questioning what they're telling you but mm -hmm. these people were pretty adamant about it they just they kind of stuck to what they saw and didn't add anything to it you know the one thing about these sightings uh in and around chicago was very interesting to me and that i was fortunate myself tobias and manuel were fortunate enough to get these sightings from the get-go was because I had a very similar encounter back in 1988 of something very similar. And uh, I, you know, that's something that has kind of got me thinking over the years as to why, you know, I was able to have this encounter and then be able to investigate and report on these sightings in Chicago, because quite frankly, and you know, this is why we get a lot of pushback on this is that mm -hmm. the three of us have been getting 95% to uh, percent of the sightings out of Chicago. Now, I, you know, I don't know if any other groups are serious enough to look into it or what the deal is, but us three have been getting the sightings. Uh, we have been getting sometimes it's just a case of uh, people go online and they look for something well, that's, that's prominent to yeah. show. And if you go online and you investigate winged humanoids, you'll find um, the phantoms and monsters. You'll find the fortune, the singular fortune society, yeah. etc. And they'll just pop up. So you go to the that may uh, very well be the yeah. brand. The, the brand stands out first, right? But even early on, it was like that. Which huh. you know, I, I was I was kind of surprised by that but uh no it just seemed to work out that way and uh you know it's um you know it, this phenomena is, is just it, it's really hard to comprehend to a degree because it, it is a fleeting thing uh i can understand why people don't get photographs of it because it is fleeting it's a shock thing uh who's gonna First thing you think about is is not getting a photograph of it, pulling your phone up out of your pocket and getting a photograph of it. It just doesn't work that way. And something uh, something flying as well is so difficult to capture. Oh, that um, too. Even with something you know about, there were um, there were several kites with a lovely you know with a lovely circular pattern under the wings here last year. And I was waiting at a bus stop near a garden center and sorry to take my daughter back home. We'd been shopping and they were hovering over this field and they were beautiful. And I had my camera and I had it pointed at them and I captured them maybe twice in 20 yeah. minutes of waiting. It was really difficult. And they yeah. stayed in the same area. Um, and but what about something that's fleetingly just zipping past and you're in shock and you're not camera prepped. Right. Uh, I don't think people you know, perceive this a lot of the time. Uh, there's a little something on the internet earlier of somebody that tried to um, walk around the corner and, and saw a deer you know, looking back at them and try to capture it on camera. And before they even clicked the camera off, it was off in the distance and it was just a little smidge on the camera, you know, like a poor, blurry Bigfoot photo. Yeah. Um, and I just don't know why people expect that everybody is, you know, Click well, happy and ready, or wearing a GoPro or something like that. Yeah, you know the 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 cryptid world and the enthusiast in particular, uh, they expect instant results, huh. instant gratification. I'm afraid, yeah. that's and that's right. just it. Just does not work that way. Yeah, there's a lot of um. Well, you know, it's um. I I notice in the. the Cryptozoology enthusiast world, or the same with paranormal. If there's a lot of, you know, I'm not happy with my meal. I'd like to see the manager kind of complaints, right? Yeah. And really, what you're saying is, well, this is 
this is all we've got in the menu. You know, we are searching for things that are not proven to exist. Uh, so I'm sorry I couldn't fulfill your need for proof right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, because people say, jump up and say, show me some evidence. You know, I, I, otherwise I'm out of here. I'm off your page. Okay, well. <laughs> yeah, I hear that a lot. Right. I mean, right, if there's no, if there's no picture of it or no body, mm. then it's not worth. Well, mm. you know, then don't read about it. I mean, I, that's fine with me. You can do what. What you are you want. doing here? Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, but look, I I think that's that's all by the by, and it's 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 part of the world we inhabit, and you just kind of get used to it. There are wonderful supporters as well that really love this genre and. And the one thing I've started to realize a lot more of recently is just how, just how um, big-hearted you know, some of the fans are uh, of this particular genre are to the researchers. You know, they give you support year after year after year after year by the books, go to the conferences when there were conferences, and um, it's amazing. It's amazing that they should be along for the ride for so long for, for individuals such as you, yourself and, and others. And I like that. Uh, one, one of the things I really like about you, though, Lon, is just it's so holistic what you do. You know, you've got those cryptids, yes. And then you also uh, do uh, alien disclosure encounters like that. Tell us about the your research into the, the alien phenomenon. Well, you know, I had been doing that for a long time, actually. I um, I was always interested in the, uh, the abduction scenario. Uh, you know, when I was just a kid and the Betty and Barney Hill uh, incident started to become mainstream and st started getting out there, I was quite interested in And uh, I guess I'm dating myself, but then I, I was really... <laughs> I was really into that. And of course yeah. I, and though I never thought I would do investigations of alien abduction, but, um, I, I, I was fortunate enough about 10 or 11 years ago to, uh, come across David Eckhart uh -huh. who lives in near Pensacola, Florida and his uh, encounters with these beings and still having encounters. And, uh, he, he disclosed to me everything that he absolutely could disclose. I mean, and quite frankly, you know, I've kind of put it out there bits and pieces over the years, and I really haven't told the whole story yet. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff there I just don't think people are ready to hear. But uh, anyway, what I, I have put out there and what David has put out there is a pretty extraordinary. And he's been able to capture images of uh of some of these beings some of the transports they use the portals opening and closing all kinds of different uh manifestations that they use uh how they cloak and such and he you know he's he's documented a lot of that and uh but he by he by far he's not the only person i have dealt with i mean i'm currently involved with a case now in puerto rico uh that you know we're actively working on so um and but I, it always seems i have a uh an abduction or a close encounter case on you know on the stove you know or on something <laughs> i'm working something with. cooking uh yeah it's um it, it's just one of those things that they seem to they they seem to gravitate towards me for whatever reason, um, and uh, you know I'm. It, it's interesting. It is tragic in some sense because I have had clients who have actually disappeared and, and just never showed back up. I oh, have really? one in, instance in particular. Yeah, uh, it does happen. I mean, you you disappeared know, it, from their address or off your radar. <laughs> No, they are, you know, Gone. their families have no idea what happened. Uh, yeah. they, uh, they were abducted in the home, and uh, they just never show back up. I mean, uh, it, it does happen. Um, it's not told. The stories don't seem to get out there that much. Uh, I just don't understand why, but they aren't. I mean, it's kind of like this 411 and what David Pilates has yeah. been reporting yeah. with disappearance as well it happens as well to people that go through the abduction scenario 
people that have abducted several times and then suddenly are taken, presumably, and, and just don't return. I think what a lot of people don't realize is with missing people is that without any particular evidence of a crime, there's really not much that can be done about it. No, especially if they're an mm. adult. There's not a whole mm. lot that, no. that law enforcement will do. And I, yeah. I, I have found that out firsthand. Mm. But, I mean, all they can do is just take the report and, and see if anything comes up <clears throat> that they can follow up on. But, uh, you know, it has happened. I mean, it, it I, I document some of the stories in the book. Uh, it, it, it does happen. So, um, you know, it's, and it's something I just, I, I just continuously, uh, you know, I just continuously work on. And what I'm, I'm curious, uh, for somebody who doesn't really investigate <clears throat> these kinds of things, you know, my, I suppose my first exposure, uh, to this, uh, the idea of this phenomenon was through, um, Whitley Strivers communion. That book right. that came out in the eighties, I think. I'm not sure when it came out. Um, and I even then I didn't really know about the book. I didn't get it until a friend of mine, um, I would have been quite young at the time, made me watch a movie with Christopher Walken. I was a Christopher Walken fan. Uh as a young kid, which seems strange, but I like Christopher Walken. So he was in the movie playing Whitney Striper and um mm-hmm. afterwards I bought the book and so it seemed like a real strange thing to me, you know little people or tall strange creatures sometimes coming and taking people away and performing sometimes experiments on them or tests or just um unusual things happening to them now what what's the general report that you get with an abduction is it does it always follow the same um prototype the same style or or the, the types of creatures and the types of things that happen during the abduction change from person to person well, it does change. I mean, there are different types of scenarios. Uh, it does seem to have evolved over years, uh, which is interesting. Um, mm. I think most of the, most of the encounters nowadays actually involve several types of beings. And when I say several types of beings, I'm talking like four or five different beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, either an encounter, say, in the house where different beings will show up, but mostly when they're taken to another location. And there seems to be a hierarchy of those uh, aliens or non-terrestrial beings that are involved. It does seem to be different ones there. Uh, you know, earlier when when you had these encounters, it was usually just one specific type of uh, uh, class of alien that was involved with the abduction, and then they would do s- certain experiments, probing mm-hmm. and such, and that kind of evolved into the um, the actual harvesting of uh, of genetic material, eggs mm-hmm. and sperm and such, where you know people would start you know being presented hybrid children uh, during an during abduction. The abduction. Yeah, and uh, you know, I have run into a few of those over the time, but I'd say in the last twenty years, it, it's evolved more into this uh, this multiple type of uh, entity involved with the uh, the actual abduction, and uh, there there has been some experimentation seen or performed. But it is to a lesser degree than what you know what most are. Uh, it's mostly one of these things where they will do the abduction, hold the person for a certain amount of time, and if there is anything done, they really don't realize it unless when they do return and they notice some type of scar or uh-huh. puncture marks or scoop marks. Uh, so it's more in the, either they've forgotten the experience completely or uh, yeah, and, they, and they it, were unaware of it and they came back and found a little mark on their neck. Well, a lot of times, the, a lot of times these things will take many decades till they realize what had actually happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've come, come across that before as well. So, uh, yeah, so it does seem to have evolved over, over time. Uh, you know, I, you know, I was talking about the, um, 
the one case, and this is the case that kind of stuck with me, mm. was where this individual had um, contacted me. I was trying to help them, and what happened was the person actually was, was I believe, abducted and never returned. Uh, this was hap- This actually happened in a <clears throat> in July 2009. I got a phone call, and a young woman. Her name was Mandy. Told me that her life had just become a complete living hell, and uh, she was afraid to leave the house at night. She said she was literally afraid to dark, mm-hmm. and fell as siege. Well, she, you know, she was under siege at home. Uh, they were her and her mother were living in a uh, farmhouse outside a small town in East Central Washington, very close to the Idaho border, maybe about a mile away. And about two weeks prior to contacting me, her and her mother had noticed bright red and white lights hovering around the Coeur d'Alene mountain range in Idaho. Uh, they they noticed this at night, and you know they'd watch the the lights. But she would start to become dizzy and fearful when they started watching these. So mm. she was having horrific nightmares and hearing loud mechanical voices. And she said when she woke up in the morning, she would feel sick. Now, she was a school teacher. So, but the one time she had to actually call, call, call in sick. Uh, so... This one particular morning, uh, she said she felt better, and but the lights had continued for several nights mm. above the mountains. So she said her one a few nights later, her and her mother were in the kitchen cleaning up after a late dinner, and they started hearing popping sounds. Uh, they were coming from the backyard. So when they looked out the window, they noticed hundreds. A small red and white lights flying around in all directions. Uh, Every time a pair of these lights would collide, there was a distinct popping sound. So Mandy ran into the living room and looked out the front window, and there were red and white lights everywhere, even across the road in the field. So uh, her mother picked up the phone to call the police, but there was no downtone. And by that time, the lights in the house began to flicker. Uh, there were strange light, strange sounds coming from the roof, similar to scratching sounds. Now, this continued for about five minutes and then stopped. Uh, they were confused and scared, of course. Now, the phone was working, but her mother thought there was no reason to call the police since there was no activity. So, you know, Mandy walked outside to see if there's any indication of what they had seen. But everything seemed fine, but she did notice a slight odor in the air. It kind of reminded her of burnt motor oil. Uh, so they, you know, they just were bewildered and didn't know what happened. So the next night, about 1030 in the evening, uh, Mandy was getting ready for bed. And while standing in the front of her bathroom mirror, she uh, noticed two loud thuds on the roof. She went into her mother's room to see... She had heard the sounds, but she was in bed asleep. So while walking in the upstairs hallway t- back towards her room, she heard several more thuds on the roof as well as scampering sounds in the attic. Hmm. So she looked out her bedroom window. Once again, these hundreds of small red and white lights were flying all about. And the, by this time, the noises had awakened her mother. They both yelled for each other as then the electricity went off. Uh, They ran to Mandy's room, sat nervously on the bed. The thuds on the roof and the scampering continued. They they lit a few candles, hoping the activity would soon stop. I mean, they felt like prisoners in their home, their own home, uh, worried about what would happen next. And suddenly the lights came back on, noises stopped. And Mandy, Mandy later told me that the commotion went on for at least an hour. Wow. Uh, so they didn't get much sleep at night. So a few days later, Mandy contacted me. Now, I was referred to her from a paranormal investigator in, in Spokane. Uh, as soon as I began talking to her and her mother, I sensed that, you know, this was no run of a mill unexplained encounter. Something 
different about this. Um, you know, she felt like they were both in danger and asked if I heard any similar occurrences or experiences. Uh, I was a bit down, dumbfounded, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, but I had this feeling, conscious feeling that this was going to lead to some type of physical intervention. I was just afraid. I though I didn't want to tell her that. I didn't want to shake them up. So I believe we talked for about three hours that night. You know, nothing exceptional about her and her mother. They lived in the family home. Uh, that's where she was born. You know, I didn't talk, ask about the father or anything like that. And uh, they seemed like very normal people. Her mother had just retired as from the state. Um, so, you know, she asked me, why is this happening to us? And, you know, I, I, I didn't want to tell them that I thought they were being singled out, but I did have that feeling. And were they rural? Were they a rural family living out? Yeah, they were. Side? Well, the town itself was really small and they were kind of on the outskirts of the ah, town. Okay. So isolated. Yeah. So, right. uh, you know, I, but I really, you know, I, I, by this time, I did sense that something was happening. Little did I know, though, that this would be my li- last contact with Mandy. Wow. Because after I got off the telephone with her and her mother, I, I you know, I started looking through my database, trying to find some of their cases. And, you know, as far as the lights and the noises and such, and I, I really didn't find anything. So the next day, I expected a follow up phone call from Mandy. Uh, and in fact, I left a, a call and I left a message on our, our service. And, you know, I waited three days and there were no phone calls or an email. So then on a Sunday afternoon, I got a call from her number and it was Mandy's mother. And she apologized for not getting back to me. But she was obviously distressed. And uh, after a brief pause, she called me and said, Mandy is missing. Hmm. So, you know, of course, I got that real sick feeling in my stomach. Hmm. Um, and what happened, uh, she tried to explain to me that Mandy had gone to bed not long after we had talked on the phone that night. And her mother remained downstairs in the living room while watching television. She said at about 8 p.m. she decided to go to her bedroom. And as she passed Mandy's bedroom, she noticed light coming from the bottom of the door. So she knocked on the door in order to check on her, and there was no response. And as she opened the door, the room went completely dark. She flicked on the light, switched by the door, and observed that Mandy wasn't in bed. She called out to her, but there was no response. And panic set in, and she started literally screaming Mandy, you know, running around the house. And there was no trace of her. She was gone. Oh, terrifying. So the um, the local authorities had no explanation. All of Mandy's personal items, including her car, were still there. Purse was everything was still there. It was this she just simply vanished, which I believe she did. And uh, wow. since Mandy was an adult, there wasn't really much the police could do about it. They, um, and of course, they suspect she took off with somebody during the night. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but I asked her mother to keep me updated. But I have to be honest with you, I never really expect to hear back from her. But I did, uh, and as far as I know, she's never returned these past 10 years. I have made inquiries with the uh, Washington State Police, and uh, it still remains unsolved, and there has been no trace of her. So, uh, yeah, that, that one sticks with me. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, do you have a worry for yourself sometimes when you're involved in these investigations people are going missing you're in the know about what's happening have you had any experiences where you (laughs) feel somehow you've been uh, warned or threatened or um uh, you've been made aware that you they are aware whoever they are oh they're aware uh (laughs) i um when you know after i got involved with david David was telling me that they are allowing me to help investigate what's going on with him. And I I didn't really understand what he meant by that. But he did say they know about you and they know that you're 
helping me to explain, understand what's going on with me. And they think it's okay. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, that's interesting. So anyway, uh, in 19, in, in 2015, my wife con- uh, contracted cancer. So uh, that year, uh, before she passed, for about an eight-month period, I had three encounters at home. And the first two were... Now, I was sleeping outside. I was sleeping in the living room at that time because she had the bed to herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I woke up on two occasions with these tall, three tall gray aliens standing beside my recliner. And, I mean, they were just there looking down on me. I, I can't say I was scared. I was surprised, but I can't say I was really scared. And, uh... On the third occasion, I was abducted. And when I say abducted, I believe I was taken to another location. I never did figure out where it was at. But all I I do remember being at another location and looking at a display or some type of screen that they were showing me. It was the same three tall white aliens. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, I remember a lot of what they showed me. I don't think I remembered mo- all of it, but basically what they were doing was give, showing me their evidence of how and why the, uh, these beings have become part of the human story, the history. And what what were they showing you about the the how? Well, and why? what was the reason for them becoming part of our story? The what I witnessed, what I witnessed on this screen, and was what was this, just you know explained to me by them. And this was telepathic. This wasn't, you know, I still don't understand how I was getting this information. But basically what I witnessed was a colossal disc-shaped craft that descended and landed in an area of what is now the present-day now River Delta. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And there were indications where, you know, like they would have a map that would show where it is now, what it looked like then, and everything. It, it was this was pretty amazing. And at the time, this location was completely encircled by the Mediterranean Sea, and that this craft later transformed into a massive and magnificent island. Uh, and the way it was explained to me that this was the genesis of a great empire that encompassed the surrounding indigenous people in the land. Uh, the rulers of this empire were the actual occupants of the craft that landed there. And that their knowledge was disseminated throughout the region. The bloodline merged with the people and, the, you know, all the native people and such. They communi- Then they communicated to me that this empire was a nexus of several dominant and lesser civilizations. And I remember asking them, was this Atlantis? The first thing came to my mind, but I never received an answer. Hmm. Uh, what I witnessed were representations of various cultures that developed over the millennia, uh, brief glimpses of time, while others were of mighty empires. Um, but it always had a direct connection to the occupants of the craft. Now, there was a particular emphasis on the development of the ancient Egyptians. Now, I observed basically order being created out of chaos, uh, a civilization that was deeply influenced by the beliefs of these extraterrestrials. And that for thousands of years, they continued this intervention as the alien gods of some type and became part of their culture. Um, I actually believe that the the period of time when this craft landed was around 
13 to 1250 it's 13,000 or 12,500 years BC that's kind of the the area the the date range that was shown to me um they they did make some uh showed me some particular series of events that occurred during Egypt's 18th dynasty uh which was what the new kingdom of of Egypt the era which the ancient Egypt was Egypt was uh at its peak of its power basically uh-huh. and um uh, you know you're i don't know if you're familiar with the 18th dynasty and the egyptians uh, not but, particularly no. but this this period of time that i was shown was during the uh, reign of uh amenhotep the third okay and i can which, yeah which greatly affected the royal family and the priesthood uh something happened there was an encounter during his reign this encounter was interpreted by Amenhotep III as a divine message that the pharaoh was the god that rivaled Amun-Ra, which wow. was the the main deity of the their religion, and uh, also rivaled the priesthood. Now, anybody knows the history of Amenhotep's reign? There, there were some issues in the actual history, but. Nothing as to what was being shown to me. And uh, Amenhotep III's display of power and disdain for the priesthood was watched very closely by his son, Amenhotep IV, who later changed his name to Akhenaten. Yeah. And when Akhenaten became pharaoh, of course, he, he established a quasi monotheistic belief of the solar deity, Aten, uh, which I believe... And was shown to be a representation of either an alien being or a craft of some type. And I think this has really affected the family and affected him as to why this belief was manifested into this, even though it was a short uh, on the Armada period of 18 years. I think that's the reason why this occurred. And... Um, I mean, and, and they were sh- I had been shown a, a few other things as well. Uh, uh, some things, fascinating. Is some really- things that had to do with uh, uh, the other son, Prince Tuthmos, who was somehow banished into the eastern desert for unknown reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, they basically told me that he returned from the desert during the beginning of the 19th dynasty and was known as the Prophet Moses. Uh, that's what was told to me. Uh, you can interpret that any way you want sure, to. Sure, I mean, uh, <laughs> but you know, one could assume that within the name Tup Moses, that, that Moses does seem to, um, it does seem to, to to be in that. And uh, I, I have told this to a lot of people, and in a way it does parallel to some of the theories of Edgar Casey and actually Sigmund Freud wrote a book about it, um, which I didn't know about until I started researching it after this occurred. So, uh, you know, that's my experience with the aliens basically that I happened in the end of 2015 and I haven't really had anything occur to me since that time and why it happened then i don't know but i I believe it has a lot to do with david well i I think that yeah that's it's fascinating what you were shown but it's also fascinating that you should have such an experience i I gotta ask of course the the three tall white aliens how did they appear what 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 was their what do they look like well they looked like you know like a smaller gray but much bigger uh, they had the same type of heads with the wraparound eyes, the oval, long, the large black oval eyes. Uh, spindly in, in structure, in stature. Uh, Clothed? They, no, no clothes that I could tell. 
Uh, they seem to move without walking, mm -hmm. basically maybe gliding, I guess. I didn't really see them move a whole lot. Uh, but they were always, they always appeared as three. They never appeared as just one or two. They always appeared as three. Um, I mean, it's very, very interesting, very curious. And, um, you know, for somebody who's never really seen anything like that, it's, it's, uh, an astonishing thing. A lot of people report to me this feeling of, um, awe, but not fear. And you mentioned something like that. Yeah. That you weren't afraid. Uh, and yet you were in a state of, uh, I'm guessing, awe or suspense. Um, well, you know, I have, I have determined, or my theory is, a lot of times before one of these abduction scenarios, uh, the actual abductee is either shown some type of series of lights, orbs, or something like that, or something is used to calm them. Uh -huh. uh, before the actual abduction itself. Okay, like I have a psychological that, sedative. Yeah, I have I have heard that many times. Mm. They, not that they realize what is going to happen, but whatever this this mechanism they use is, it it tends to calm them down. Uh, I guess they maybe learn through experience that they need to calm humans down before they yeah. do anything. Yeah. They'd have to calm me down, like that. Yeah, sure. uh, I, um, I think that's in, in, in more more than not. It seems that some type of thing is used uh, to do to calm uh, these abductees down. I, but I mean, it would it would be. I I always try to think. It, you know, whether you're talking about um, you know, it, aliens or angels or whatever. Or what happens in the Bible when an angel is sent by God to tell somebody something says do not be afraid they always fall down and they crumple don't they you yeah. see them and they collapse and they're terrified and it says don't be afraid do not be afraid i'm a servant like you stand up and it's strange that actually the first reaction is fear but also the first reaction of the being being talked about in that biblical context at least is one of um calming the subject and afterwards, the subject seems to revive and, you know, be able to, to receive whatever uh, message you know, that the, 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 the angels come to bring to them. Now, moving on from that a little bit, um, just before we finish, in some of your books, I see that there's some some study on, on reptoids. Um, now, I'm not quite sure of the difference. I'm assuming a reptoid is, is that something a bit more like the lizard man of Skapor? Or is a reptoid more of a reptilian creature that's a, connected with the alien conspiracies as well? Well, you know, when you talk about these reptoid cryptids or reptilian cryptids, yeah, you're, you're talking like what people see. Uh, you, talk, you said scape or uh, lizard man or something to that effect. Yeah, as far as the aliens go, these seem to be specific races of uh, these alien or extraterrestrial beings that have reptilian characteristics. Now, why that is, uh, I don't know. Are they are they something that has evolved for something else? That I, I that's also something I don't know. But they do seem to be one of the hierarchy a uh, hierarchy of of alien beings involved with a, an abduction. Our encounter, they seem to run the show for the most part to direct uh, other beings through during the abduction. Though I, I do believe from some of the evidence that I have seen that these, uh, these reptilians eventually are the ones that do, that do dis ascend to a higher level actually transform or manifest or even shapeshift into a more insectoid like being uh -huh. which usually ends up being the one that's running the whole operation uh, that that is information that I have received from experiencers over the years 
where they have noticed uh it seems to be the the higher being the higher being on the the food chain uh as being looking more like a a praying mantis or mantis like being mm-hmm. but not so much dissimilar from the actual reptilians um you know i i think that you know i think that may be what the case i think the uh the top dog if you want to call it the overlord of the uh of these uh of uh, these reptilians does eventually kind of evolve into an insectoid looking being um you know something as as far as the reptilians go now david and his family when they were being abducted early on and this started about 15 years ago uh they were being abducted by a few small grays but it was always directed by a particular reptilian Uh and it was the same reptilian that just kept coming back and kept coming back and in fact you know, when David had his uh, encounters, he was allowed to see a lot of different things. Now, for whatever reason, and this is something David doesn't even understand, why he was given uh, the opportunity to see some of the activity involved with these abductions and some of the life. Uh, he was shown underground caverns and... Uh, uh, Aliens and humans being used as slave work, labor, uh, experimentation on human beings, uh, even to the point where humans were actually disintegrated and used or killed, basically, in in furnace-like apparatus uh, that were never returned. Um, and I, I have a, I described that in the book. It, it's not it's not pretty. The whole thing is not pretty. And I'm quite honest with you, I, I, I tried to uh, sugarcoat it as much as I could mm-hmm. when I talked about it. Seems it is very dark. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is dark. dark. Very dark. But um, this particular reptilian, even though he was, I guess, assigned to David, he didn't like David, and he told David he didn't like him. But he he was following orders. He was doing what he had to do. This these reptilian David tells me spoke English. Huh. They literally talked to him, uh, which you know is something I haven't ever heard before. But uh, in this in these instances with David, it's that's what he described as happening. Um. But he was assigned this one, this this one being. Now, the one the one aspect of what of this relationship between him and David were was an um, was a conversation they had at one period of time, where this reptilian told David, not unlike humans, the alien species, and a lot of these alien species work together uh, in their life and these abductions, all the work they do. They all have one supreme being, one deity. Which, you know, like what we'd say would be God. Mm. Uh, they had, they do believe in one supreme being. And now is it, one thing that David was never able to really determine was, was this a living being or was this some intrinsic type of uh, uh, invisible God or some type? I don't know. But they they did stress that they re- were relied upon this, this being and that they followed it, its instructions to a T. So... Hmm. 